It was interesting as I was going through this short little scene of you complete me. I'm sure that's been said many times in a relationship. You had me at hello, I'm sure has been said many times as a spouse walks in as a joke. I'm sure it's been done not by myself ever, but I'm sure it's been done in many relationships. But it was interesting as we're going through this, the topic today of singleness, as I was preparing and I was looking at this clip, I'm like, man, he obviously wasn't complete beforehand. He or she was not complete, but now, since they're together, man, they are complete, right? I hope not. I hope not from, from that scene. But the interesting thing is that a lot of society, a lot of our culture, looks at a scene like that and are like, wow, you're right. You are absolutely right. I need to find someone who's going to do that to me to complete whatever it is I'm lacking to complete me. And as we look at singleness today, um, I want to just take an idea from Tim Keller. Tim Keller, author <clears throat> and preacher as well, um, he has a couple different views of singleness and marriage and in different societies and different cultures. And he says there's, there's, there's one view of singleness and marriage that looks at it like it's an asset in your portfolio, uh, it, it's a means to an end, it's, it's self-fulfillment, it enhances you, it gets you where you're trying to be or gets you where you're trying to go. Uh, it's, it's there when you are completed your university and your training and you've got a job and then you paid off your debts and now it's something to look into as in marriage. That's kind of one view he would say that people have of marriage. Another view is maybe a little bit closer to home where you're basically nothing, I'm not saying, he says there's, you're, basically, you're basically nothing unless you are married. If you don't have a spouse, if you don't have a family, um, there's a lot of pressure there. So everything revolves whether or not you find a spouse or whether or not you have a family. And if you're single here today, or if you are married here today, maybe you've experienced one or both of those types of situations. As I was going to bed last night, uh, against the, yeah, I, I decided to go on BBC a little bit just to see what was the latest news. I was scrolling down on my phone and I came across an article. You may have seen this article. Uh, it was an article about a couple uh, who faked their own uh, marriage on Facebook. And so I was like, that's interesting. So I opened up the article and see what they have to say. And did anyone read this article? Am I the only one? I'm the only one. Just scroll down a little bit further. It's not your top few stories. It's, it's, it's further down. So um, as I was reading this article, I found it interesting because this couple uh, in, in Congo, um, they, they didn't come to the wedding together. They, they came to a wedding of a friend and they were wearing a, the, the same patterned uh, outfit, I guess, which is common if you're supporting a certain side, either the bride or the groom's side, I guess you wear uh, the same pattern shirt or dress or something. So they had the same pattern and they were sitting beside each other uh, after the wedding. And so someone came and took a picture of them and posted it on social media. And so uh, this, within a very short time, um, their phone started blowing up. What's happening here? Um, someone said, did you guys get married? And so they decided to play along with it a little bit. And so they, they played it up and said, yeah, we did get married. And so then they strategically took a second photo of them in the, uh, how do you say it? The chairs where the married people would sit, almost like a throne in some ways. They went and sat in there and they had a, a, a photo taken and then they posted on social media again saying we got married and then went their separate ways that night, woke up the next morning to, as one of them says, hundreds of messages on WhatsApp, notifications, phone calls, all these things. So at that point they decided, okay, we should probably come clean and say we didn't actually get married, which was kind of interesting. But I took three quotes from that article that I'd like to read. And I can't remember if this was the guy or the girl, 
but the quote says here, it may be a bit sad because you reach a certain level where you are happy, but society pushes you to think that you are incomplete. A second quote says, even, in, even if it's a normal part of life to be single, a lot of people find it very difficult and suffer from social pressure. And then this last one really was like, wow. Uh, it, I think this was the guy talking. He says, in many, in many churches, according to Mwema Ngandu, preachers talk about this, quote, single spirit, as though people inhabited by an evil spirit of celibacy needed to, quote, see the light and get married. Um, a, a little contrary to what the Bible would say. And so I got some really interesting quotes from there. If you have a chance to read the article, read the article. It's, it's interesting. But first off, as we get into this topic of singleness today, married people, I want you to stay tuned in. I don't want you to be drifting off saying, oh, this is for singles. Um, I know many a time there are single people here who have had to sit through many marriage sermons, many family sermons, many sermons on children. Uh, we can, there are applications for all of us this morning as we are here. The church has elevated marriage, and that's a good thing. But I think at the same time, we've unintentionally devalued the season of singleness. And if you're single and you feel that way, um, I just want to say personally, I'm sorry. Because you need to know that the church that you attend values and loves single people. And coming out and, and giving a sermon on singleness uh, was, was a challenge for me. So this whole last few weeks, I've been doing a lot of reading and a lot of talking to other people because I need a lot of help with this one. I'm like, where do I even go with this? Because as far as the single life is concerned, it's been a while since I've been single. Angie and I were married when I was 23. So when it comes to the single life, I barely lived it, if you could call it that. Um, unless you want to count like maybe the first three or four years of college, that was my single life after high school. So I don't know anything about graduating. Uh, I don't know anything about getting a job, living out the single life. So experientially, I don't have that experience. So what I've been doing is I've been talking to people. I've been reading a lot in preparation for this. I've had some good dialogue with some people in the community here because I wanted to get down to some ideas about singleness, uh, some of the struggles with singleness, and some of the unique opportunities that single people have. So in some ways, personally, this is me kind of repenting from where I have um, not been aware of some of the struggles and wanted to say as me, want to get better personally at encouraging you to live out your singleness. <clears throat> With that said, I want to overgeneralize here for a second because it seems that in general, Singles are viewed by themselves as well as others as lacking something. The longer the singleness remains, the more both singles and marries view the situation through the lens of loss. And this is a common story that I've heard both in reading and in conversation with singles. What happens in your younger single days as your friends start to get married, your, friend, your married friends then try to hook you up with some of their friends and hope that you find that spouse. And I have been guilty of this many times. My sister-in-law got married later in life in her 30s. Uh, my older brother is in his later 40s. He's still single. I've had many friends who have gotten later in life. And I've said a bunch of really inappropriate things as I've talked with them. You know, he or she would be good for you. Oh, look at them. They're pretty. Why don't you go for them? Uh, they have a really nice personality. You could date them. Just different things like that that I don't think at the time were really helpful. So something happens. When the singleness persists, marriages start to think that something may be wrong with you. And singles begin to feel as though God has robbed them of something or forgotten them by not giving them this blessing of a life partner. 
So what I want to start with right out, of the, out of the gate is that both the married couple that would view singleness as an odd thing and the single man or woman who would view God have, as having forgotten them or robbed them of a joy by not giving them a spouse are way out of line of how the word of God talks about singleness and how Jesus himself and other biblical authors rejoiced in their singleness. Will that take the ringing away? Right to my mouth. Okay. First point I want to share today is singleness is a gift. Singleness is a gift. So the Bible is clear that singleness is a gift from God. That's how it it views singleness. Not like a second class type of status, but it's as a gift. And this is Paul speaking. And if you have your Bibles with you this morning, we're going to be sticking a little bit in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians 7. I want to start with verses 6 and 7, and then we're going to go a bit further down uh, in the chapter a bit later on. Verses 6 and 7. It says, Now as a concession, not a command... I say this, I wish that all of you were as I myself am. He's talking about being single here. But each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one from another. Or one has this gift, another has that. So when Paul is speaking of singleness, and specifically the gift of singleness, he's not saying there's a select few people that have this gift of singleness. That's not what's being taught here. Rather, he's teaching that where you are in the circumstances of life, that God's gift to you, if you're married, then you have the gift of marriage. If you're single, you have the gift of singleness. But what if I don't think I have the gift of singleness? I don't find it easy being on my own, let's say. I desire to get married. Does that mean I'm experiencing second best? Paul would say no. When Paul speaks of singleness as a gift, He isn't speaking of a particular ability that some people have to be content. Rather, he's speaking of the state of being single. As long as we have it, it's a gift from God, just as marriage will possibly be someday as well. We need to receive our situation in life, whether it's singleness or marriage, as a God's gift of grace to us. But the gift that you have today, maybe it's singleness, maybe it's it's marriage, I think there are many that are not seeking it the right way. Some of us are, le- are, are seeking to lose the gift that we've been given. I'll try and explain that a little bit. If you're, we're married people, I guess, are trying to be single, and single people are trying to be married. If you look at, if we're, if we're looking at this idea of, of a gift, there are many marrieds that look at They see a single person and desire, oh, I wish I could go back to those days when I didn't have that responsibility or this. I could go and do whatever I want, be wherever I want, with whoever I want. So there's that desire to go back to that. And singles, the opposite way around as well. I see that family, I see that couple. I desire to to have what they have. That will cure a lot of things. That will cure loneliness, that will cure sexual temptation, that'll cure lots of things if I only had that. And many are dis- discontent. Many are discontent with the season of life that God has them in. And instead of using the gift that you have, you're seeking to lose that gift. But Paul makes it clear, he sees singleness as a gift, even though it means being celibate, as he mentions later on, for the Christian. This idea of, of celibacy, It's tough. It's a really, really tough thing as a single person. I've been there to living out a life that is pure before God and pleasing to God. Uh, Personally, I have been mocked, made fun of, and couldn't believe in the day and age that I was a teen growing up and into my early 20s, couldn't believe that I would somehow have been remained pure in God's eyes until the day that Angie and I got married. That was a tough thing to do 
for all those years until, until marriage to stay that way, um, it was hard. So, again, I know a little bit what it's like. <clears throat> the second point I wanted to, to share is it's not eternal. It's not eternal. We're going to go down a few verses to verse number 28. Verse 28, we'll look at to 31. It says, But if you do marry, you have not sinned. That's good. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you this. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not, those who mourn as if they did not, those who are happy as if they were not, those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep, those who use the things of this world as if not engrossed in them, for this world in its present form is passing away. Sometimes I like to read the message just to kind of go along with that. I'll read out what the message says in the same, uh, in verses 29 to 31. It says, I do want to point out, friends, that the time is of the essence. There's no time to waste, so don't complicate your lives unnecessarily. Keep it simple. In marriage, grief, joy, whatever, even in ordinary things, your daily routines of shopping and so on, deal as sparingly as possible with the things the world thrusts on you. This world, as you see it, is on its way out. So our world has a different perspective on marriage and singleness. They say you jump into marriage, then when it doesn't make you happy, you, get, you just get right back out. And while you're single, you go and, quote, sow your wild oats and really enjoy it because why else would you need to get married? And there's all these different perspectives on singleness and marriage, but Paul says we need to have a biblical perspective on singleness and marriage, and that includes this context of eternity. Because here's what he's saying. You weren't made for this world. You're made for a perfect world, and Christ is going to come back and set that here. So whatever you do, make sure you maintain that eternal perspective. Our time on earth, as we know it, is short. So as you mourn, it's okay to mourn. It's okay to be sad, but don't mourn like those who have no hope. He says, as you're happy, praise God. It's good to be happy. But understand that happiness is just a short kind of commercial of the joy that's to come. If you buy things, praise God. It's good to buy things. But hold, don't hold them so tightly and, share them, and don't share them with others and don't let them grip your heart because moth and rust will come and destroy those. If you're married, live as though you're not. He's not saying go out and get divorced. But we have an eternal family, your church family, our faith family that we have here. There's community. We need to be aware of, as well, our spiritual family. We need to be aware that we don't take marriage as an idol. We don't make children as an idol. Or relationships as an idol. In Proverbs 18.22, it says, He who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. We know that, but it doesn't teach that if you're married, if you're not married, that it's bad. He clearly said that's good, marriage is good, singleness is also good. Singleness has advantages. Let's go down a few verses to verse 32 to 35. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his, his wife, and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. So it's saying single people here are spared the troubles of marriage. And there's many great blessings in marriage. But there are also difficulties as well. Can I get an amen? No. Not there, guys. 
Not a, I'm just kidding. Um, but understandably, many Christians and couples don't, open, don't openly talk about it. Some of the hard things that they face, which can give maybe singles a rose-tinted view of what marriage actually is. And there's even a downside, even when a married couple's relationship is good, life is just more complicated. There's more one, than one person to consider. There is how we use our time, accommodation, vehicles, holidays, the daily menu. There's more than one person to worry about. Children can bring great pleasure. They do, they're amazing. But with that, you have the opposite side of the coin as well. There's a lot of anxiety that comes with that as well. Marriage does bring trouble in this life. And Paul says, I want to spare you this. He mentions these troubles chiefly because of the bearing that they have next. Single people can devote themselves more to fully to God's work. In verses 32 to 34, it, it mentions that. And you may be here as a single person and you're like, oh great, I'm single so I can do God's work more. Um, I've had that conversation with someone before and that's how the response was. And I got to thinking, wow, really like, what other purpose are you here on earth for actually? And I think they were looking at it like they've been robbed of something and, but really, there is time for that. My best man at, at my wedding, uh, Kent, someone I had looked up to, I look up to very, very much. He, um, he got married uh, about five years ago or so in his mid-30s. And um, so he was single throughout his 20s and his 30s. And I kept in touch with him as we were dis far distance apart. And, and he's been doing some pretty amazing things. Uh, I look up to him for a variety of reasons, but one of the reasons I do look up to him is the, the fact that during all those years of being single, if you count from after high school to when he got married, 16, 17, 18 years of singleness, he did some pretty amazing things. Some advantages that he had over myself, he was able to serve overseas in a variety of locations. He was able to at his local church, serve week in, week out on worship, on um, serving with the youth, helping preaching, all these things. He started a business um, by himself. He supported missions projects financially and in other ways as well. And all the while doing it, staying pure until he was married and I was like, wow, this guy, there's advantages to being single. There are. And I look at Kent, who's now married with, with one child, as someone to, that's gone through this. And I think an important part of the Christian responsibility of married people is to care for their spouse, to care for their children. And that takes time. That takes daily, daily time as we go through our daily schedules. That time can't be used for, in other ways, furthering the kingdom, whether that be witnessing, whether that being part of Bible studies, whether that being whatever it may be, there is a dividedness part of it. You know, a few consciously choose to stay single and devote themselves to furthering God's kingdom. Most single people haven't chosen singleness in that way, and yet they have the same advantages of those who have. And instead of focusing on the difficulties of being single, I think we should look, make the most of the advantages that there are in God's gift of singleness while it's there, while, it's, while you have it. I want to go into singleness as being hard. And I've asked a, a few people um, in my conversations, what are the, what are the struggles that you, that you most experience? And I don't think the struggles of singleness are unique to singles, but I think the ways that they navigate those struggles are unique to being single, if that makes sense. Because when God saw Adam in the Garden of Eden, he said, it's not good for man to be alone. I'm going to make a suitable helper for him, in Genesis 2. So Eve was created for companionship 
and for marriage. And although the, the New Testament is positive about singleness, it's, there's no doubt marriage is regarded as the norm. And some of the struggles that single people are therefore likely to struggle with are things like loneliness and sexual temptation. And I don't think those are exclusive to those who are not married, but they're very much part of the single life. Some will seek to lessen them by getting married. Others will choose not to marry or feel unable because of the circumstances they find themselves in. And I think those two battles are closely related. The lonelier we are, the more likely we are to struggle with sexual fantasy and fall into sin. And being self-disciplined in this area, fleeing from sexual immorality in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18, you know, having someone there, having someone there be, be accountable, having one or two close friends to be accountable to yourself in this area is an incredibly huge and important thing. And I wouldn't say it's just a single thing. It's a married thing as well, this area of loneliness and um, sexual temptation. And I want to talk a little bit about sexual temptation a little bit. And just coming from, I think today, you're dealing with it in a lot. It's more difficult today, I think, than when it was when I was going through my teens and into my, into my 20s. If you're thinking about sexual temptation, if you're looking at the music videos, if you're looking at the TV shows, the movies, anything you see, you are bombarded with um, like being normal is, is sleeping together and being normal is living together. All these things are normal. And if these things are not being done, that's actually looked upon as being abnormal. Back when I was growing up, that was part of the culture, but it wasn't as... It wasn't like it was today. So dealing with all of that as a single person has got to be incredibly tough. It's tough for a married person dealing with that, but I think it's even got to be tougher for a single person dealing with some of that stuff. If you think about sexual temptation in regards to pornography, years ago, you had to be 18, or maybe your dad had some in the basement hidden away under some type of box. Uh, you actually physically had to go into a store and purchase something. Now, it's right here. It's on your phone. And instead of being a, yeah, it's, it's so in your face today. And if you're not accountable to people with this, it's got to be incredibly hard. And so I feel for single people in this area and for marriage as well. But there's this lie that's so prevalent and so powerful, we can't really blame people for buying into this lie. This lie is that the way we express ourselves sexually and the experience we have are necessary for us to be fulfilled as a human being. This is this lie that we're drinking in with every ad, every commercial, uh, that we must be fully, in order to be fully alive, we need to experience these things. If we're not, we're not fully alive. I saw an interview of someone just randomly on the street talking about, about this, and they said that, they were saying that if I didn't experience things sexually, that I'm only half human. That was the quote. Author and writer uh, Preston Sprinkle, he says the whole idea that sexual expression is essential to human flourishing comes from Freud, not from the Christian worldview. This is, again, a very modern idea that what I need to be most fully alive is a great sexual expression and great sexual experience. This is wreaking havoc, not just among marrieds, but among singles, as they try to navigate spaces where the norms are sexual expression and sexual experience. We'll come back to that in a second, but also this idea of loneliness. I think is a different way from how marrieds will struggle with loneliness. And I'd like to lay down the fact that in a certain season or time uh, in your life, you're going to experience loneliness if you're married or single. But the single may think that this loneliness will get filled by a spouse. And I think some married, peop 
I think married people are under the illusion that that's not necessarily true. Not all the time the spouse is going to meet that loneliness. So the temptation that sometimes you have to fight is to not go into this world of fantasy that married people, that, that maybe they married the wrong one and maybe somebody else out there will satisfy that need. And as we talk about loneliness and as we talk about sexual temptation, with all this said and done, the longing to not feel alone is actually pointing to something beyond itself and greater than itself. This relationship with Christ, this relationship with Jesus, our Savior, a soul that finds its home in the rest of Christ's grace and mercy is a whole that gets filled through sanctification, but only ultimately filled when Christ returns. I have one more quote here as we're, as we're finishing up this morning from Preston Sprinkle as well. He, he quotes here, he says, human flourishing doesn't depend on marriage and it certainly doesn't depend on sex. Marriage brings with it its own temptations and trials and sex within marriage often leads to pain, frustration, and other problems that married people don't often admit. To think that marriage will end your loneliness and take care of your sexual, sexual fr frustrations is a myth. Many married people wish they weren't and the majority of people struggling with sexual addictions and compulsive online habits are married men. The fact is, we are relationally and sexually messed up, and only Jesus, only Jesus, not marriage, can fix that. Jesus, the one who was single, and the embodiment of human flourishing and joy. Just some application for, for those who are single this morning, I have a few things here. First off, thank God for your gift of singleness. Whatever your experience of singleness is, recognize that it is a gift from God and make the most of it for as long as you have it. Another thing is, do some radical things for God, some time-consuming radical things for God. Start a project, a Bible study, organize an event, an outreach, do some things like that where you have um, some undivided time and you can, you can do those things. Do all you can to be godly. It's easy for those who are single to lapse, and for marrieds, to lapse into a selfish, self-centered lifestyle and into sexual sin, whether either in thought or in deed. We need to be self-disciplined, accountable to others. Have someone else that you share these things with. Your role in the church you have an important role. There are many roles in this church that are made by singles, and frankly, a lot of the things that get done around here are because of single people. There's a huge role for you to play, whatever that role may be. And keep your eyes fixed on heaven, because really it's our eternal relationship with Christ that ultimately matters. For those who are married this morning, don't think of singleness as second best. Don't think of singleness as second best or something weird or odd. Why aren't they? Christian preacher and, John, and author, John Chapman, he spoke of when friends would take him for long walks and telling him on these, locks, on these walks that he should be married. He commented, it would have been a great help if they had read the Bible, wouldn't it? Refrain from asking the same questions over and over again. Why aren't you married? You're a good human being. I don't get it. You're attractive. I don't... Are you still looking for people? Are you, are you giving up? What's the deal? Avoid asking some of the same questions over and over. Um, I don't know how helpful that is. And I know single people who I've talked to get tired of it very quickly. Are you still married? You could ask that question back. Uh, remember that your family is the whole church. Hopefully there are no... The goal would be to not have lonely people in our church. We need to be opening up our homes, relating to one another, not just in our nuclear family, but in the whole church family. And finally, f keep your eyes fixed on heaven. Human marriage matters, but it won't last forever, according to Mark 12. Our relationship with Christ 
does come first. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for this morning, Jesus. We thank you that you've given us gifts. We thank you for the gift of singleness. We thank you that um, there are many here that are doing some amazing things for your kingdom, Lord. We thank you for, for them. And Lord, we know the different difficulties of singleness. We pray, Lord, that in the end they can find fulfillment. All of us can find fulfillment in you. That's not going to be met by marriage. It's not going to be met by singleness, relationships. It's only going to be met by you, Lord. Help us to really find that and really take hold of that. Lord, just pray for these temptations that are out there, Lord. They're so easily um, in our face every single day, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us to deal with those temptations. Help us to know how um, to combat those in your word, in our relationship with you. And Lord, help us as, as marrieds as well to not view uh, singles as second best. To remember that everyone here is, is part of the church family. And Lord, help us with that as well. In your name we pray. Amen.